Welcome back to Talking Guitar, brought to you by the Carter Vintage Exchange and the North American Guitar in Nashville, Tennessee. Lindsay here, and this week I'm airing my interview with North Dakota luthier Kevin Miderman. If you're a fan of virtuosic acoustic guitar music, odds are high you've already heard a Miderman guitar. Kevin has designed and built custom models for Martin Simpson, Leo Kotke, Willie Porter, Michael Shaftelaine, John Doyle, Jack Rudder, Don Alder, among others, and this is no accident. He is himself a passionate and accomplished fingerstyle player, and he rigorously uses the scientific method, building prototype after prototype, and uses modern techniques like double tops and composite bracing to craft incredible sounding guitars that can handle the demands of modern players. So with all that said, please enjoy my chat with Kevin of Miterman Guitars. Kevin, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I'm so excited to chat with you. Um, every luthier has an interesting story to tell, but you have some kind of great, you know, just awesome elevator pitch bullet points right at the top where not only do you build beautiful guitars that have ended up in the hands of Leo Kotke and Michael Chapdelaine and, and John Doyle, but you're also a really amazing musician yourself and you've released albums with great fingerstyle playing and arrangements and your beautiful singing. And so I'm extra excited to talk about your musical background because of that. And, and you're also, you also host house concerts, which is how you got connected with Michael. And I assume other folks that you, uh, you build for. And you are a doctor still, and you, you still <laughs> practice, right? Yeah, mostly kind of mostly retired, but yeah. Okay. My first question is just how do you find the time and energy for all of that? Yeah. And so as far as the guitar stuff, it's kind of all I do. So in other words, mm -hmm. um, a lot of, let's say, physicians, uh, you know, uh, golf or um, have other hobbies to take them away. My uh, shop, uh, which we're in here, is in the house and I kind of don't leave the house. I come home and I spend kind of every waking hour in here. It's my place of, of joy and relaxation and it helps me to diffuse the the inevitable stress from the the work that I do as a surgeon. So. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And I feel like, I, I mean, I suppose like a lot of different like vocation sort of dovetail into guitar making, but being a surgeon and having a steady hand makes especially good sense to be a, a guitar maker and somebody who uses really fine tools and is really good at getting exact things out of out of out of wood. <laughs> I suppose. I mean, there's definitely a transfer of sensibilities there. I don't think one necessarily informs the other, but they're kind of of a piece. Um, yeah. The surgery I do is reconstructive surgery, microsurgery, that kind of stuff. And uh, working with wood and trying to um, make very small changes with very thin pieces of wood and tiny little joints and trying to make everything as precise as possible uh, fits perfectly with um, just working with my hands and other uh, yeah. uh, aspects of life. So, yeah. For sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, before we dive into the guitar making side of, of your life, I would love to hear more about your musical background because I assume that uh, that predated guitar making. And so I'm I'm curious to know, yeah, just, just sort of like, when did you start playing and, and what were your big influences and what's the community yeah. like where you are in North Dakota? Yeah. So, well, okay. So I um, have been playing uh, since I was a little kid. So, you know, eight or nine years old, mostly just strumming chords with, uh, you know, John Denver chord books and that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, and then somewhere along the way, uh, someone I met uh, did finger style stuff and I'd never heard that before. And so I asked him if, can you show me how to do that? And that was probably when I was 11 or 12. And, um, and then I, um, I started listening to, um, you know, <laughs> Peter Paul and Mary and uh, and Bob Dylan and those kind of things early on. Who uh, I loved the harmonies. And, oh, and I'm in a Garfunkel, and so they were doing finger style stuff and doing vocal harmonies and and uh, the songs were especially Paul Simon's songs are particularly amazing. And so that kind of uh, you start always by learning those songs, and uh, that's how you begin as a kid. Uh, um, and, uh, and then I tried to build on that and ravenously tried to suck in as much as I could from whatever, uh, source I could find, whether it was a person that was doing something that, uh, I hadn't heard before or was good at a particular thing, um, or finding some record and learning it off that. And then eventually I took, uh, 
five years of classical guitar lessons um, and uh, um, during college and high school and um, and then have been trying to learn ever since, I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Did you ever consider doing it full time? Hmm. Sort of, except um, it's one of those stories, you know, in my family, that just wasn't a thing <laughs> that was uh, uh, deemed acceptable. You know, the artist's <laughs> life, you know, we um, that's a long story. But uh, so I kind of dreamed of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I was always more of a, you know, I was an English major in college and and uh, was studying. Uh, I was spending as much time uh, playing the guitar in college in my dorm and so forth as I was, you know, doing organic chemistry. So it was a dream, um, but I never thought that uh, I would be the guy that could make it as a as a professional uh, singer, songwriter, guitar player. Uh, so I, I I went on to other things, uh, but I always kept back pocket and um, uh, and uh, subsequently have tried to do the best I can um making records and now that i'm as i mentioned earlier a, a sort of semi-retired i hope to play more do more concerts and travel a little more and um uh, put the music out there i think live music is is special i'm mean, not necessarily mine but in general mm -hmm. and I think that uh uh the, the world needs uh live music out there and uh, uh so to that end i host concerts here but then also hopefully i can play a little bit myself and uh, just kind of uh, add a little bit of that kind of beauty to the world, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, that's something that I would love to do at some point is because it's one thing to play for yourself and to do the things that you do, but to also offer your house or a way for other artists to have a platform is so important. And I think it's amazing that you've done that and that you're you're sort of contributing to the community in that way as well. You're a songwriter, too. So a lot of those songs yeah. on your album are yours. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah a lot of them. Yep, but both my records have I think the majority of stuff that I've written, and then That's stuff that I didn't write. Yeah, stuff that I didn't write, like some of the instrumental stuff, like the cocky stuff. I, I obviously didn't write that, but uh, otherwise, some of the uh, songs, like Town Van Zant uh, song, I if I needed you, I I arranged that and also changed one of the verses or wrote one of the verses, and so I tried to make it my own, um, even if I didn't write it. I guess that was yeah, the idea. yeah, yeah, the folk process. Yeah, awesome. Um, well, cool. So I guess I'm curious to know, so when, when did guitar building come into it? And do you feel like your musical career kind of, or your musical um, pa passion informed, informs your guitar building? Absolutely. Um, so as we talked about, I've always been enamored with, with solo acoustic guitar players. What a, what, what a really good player can do on that unlikely wooden box, just is still to this day, Mind blowing! It takes my breath away when you hear someone that's really great at it, and I, that's my favorite kind of music in the world. And I can't help it; it just is. And then, <clears throat> so I played guitar since I was a kid. And then, for a while, I lived in Holland, Michigan, and there was a guitar maker there named Del Langyans. I don't know if any Langyans guitars have yeah, come through. Yeah, yeah, we had one. Yeah, and it so was great. There you go. Yeah, and so uh, that was the first, uh, you know, guitar maker that I'd ever heard of. I didn't kind of know how people did that. I, you know, you see the ones off the rack: the Taylors, the Martins, the Guilds. Um, anyway, he was in our little town of Holland, Michigan, and um, had a little shop right there on the main street. And so as a guitar player and a kid, I'd go in there and um, try the guitars and he'd be in the back. It was a very small shop and his, he was just standing back there making them right behind the counter. That's, that mm -hmm. was his shop. Um, and um, if you were uh, uh, a regular, <laughs> you got to try the guitars and his guitars objectively sounded better than the ones off the rack and and i was already kind of uh, coming from a science standpoint figured you know it looks the same you look inside the bracing looks the same as the and his as the ones off the rack the woods are kind of the same how can one sound better if it looks the same what's going on there and um he was so busy that he didn't really uh have the time to you know teach him anything but i went to the library and bought some books and um and started reading and thought that i want to take, I've already been doing a lot of woodworking, just making things like, you know, little bits of furniture and speaker enclosures and nunchucks and things, you know, on the way. <laughs> uh, as a junior high school and high school student, my buddies and mine, my buddy, <laughs> my buddies and I would make things like that. So I already had woodworking chops and um, I thought, well, this would be the perfect union of everything I love, woodworking and guitar. Um, uh, uh, but then I went off to college and pre-med and medical school and residency and, and I had to 
give that up for the time. But then 30 something years ago, when I started actually practicing medicine, I would take my vacations rather than go to say, you know, a golf junket to Jamaica, I <laughs> went to guitar making school and there's a guitar making school uh, in Northampton, Massachusetts called the Leeds Guitar Maker School with Ivan Schmuckler and Alan Chapman. And, uh, uh, and so I would take a week or two at a time as a vacation um, during my first few years of practice uh, until I had what I needed, just learning the basics, starting with um, uh, uh, Ivan taught the basics of steel string making and Alan taught the basics of classical guitar making. And uh, I kind of left with what I needed and started um, building on my own after that. Um, and I think um, somewhere along the way, because I was steeped in sort of a science background, I was disillusioned with the way people were talking about uh, the craft, how to get sound. There was a lot of myth about um, you know smelling and flexing and tapping and and stuff that ended up with inconsistent guitars. You make ten guitars and maybe two sound great and two are horrible and the rest are okay. Well, that was unacceptable. I wanted to figure out why that guitar. Or going back to the shop in, uh, in Holland, Michigan, Dell shop. You know why the ones that Dell was making were different than the ones that were in the in the cupboard or on the on the wall. And so I started um, building prototypes and studying and and weighing and flexing and uh, and testing and testing and testing hundreds of prototypes to try to figure out what actually made a difference and what didn't make a difference. Um, uh, and then I would get requests from fingerstyle players who were saying, well, these, you know, guitars aren't really made for, for us. You know, they're made to be strummed with a pick and I need something articulate that's not a classical guitar. Uh, and so I started honing my making toward the professional fingerstyle player. The first player that was interested was Martin Simpson. He was living in the States at the time. He's now living in Sheffield, England. But uh, he was the first one that was... Um, generous enough to work with me. I'd send him a prototype and he'd give me some comments and send them back and forth, back and forth mm -hmm. um, to try to hone in on a sound that was right for a fingerstyle player. Articulate, um, even all across, not dropping out after the ninth fret, all kinds of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of um, the process, uh, the beginning of the process for me. Wow. Yeah, that's, wow, that's amazing. So I can't believe you just dove right into just prototypes and prototypes and I mean that makes sense though because that's that would be such a great way to to work and to sort of just accept that I, I guess you're not getting too tied to each individual guitar early on you're just you're treating them as each one is a learning experience and I'm sure most people do do that but it's um I, I that yeah that just seems like a really that particular approach seems to be especially helpful so would that have been kind of around the same time that like Santa Cruz and other folks were starting to bring back the OM and and break, making their finger sign models like in the 80s and early 90s yeah, I guess. Well, this would have been actually probably later 90s. So they'd already done okay. that. So um, I mean, yeah, maybe they hadn't quite trickled into the the guitar economy quite so much yet. <laughs> probably. I mean, I, you know, I heard of them, but yeah, right. They're, they were early. Um, uh, but yeah, this was the, uh, yeah, the late, the late 90s for me. So they'd already, mm -hmm. they were out there. I definitely heard of them. Yeah. But yeah, it seems like that it's, it's interesting to go through guitar history and see it like kind of roughly around the same, you know, 10 to 20 year time frame. A lot of different folks were like, actually, there are all these finger style players who have these specific demands. And yeah, you're right. Like, like Martin yeah. was saying to you, like they weren't finding what they really needed out of guitars. So I think that's part of why maybe we're, we're at the place we are with guitars now where there's just so much innovation and so much sort of attention to player needs and demands and you've got so many different options so it's it's pretty awesome to to really get to have that um so at that point so you were already building for players like martin um did you already sort of consider yourself like having launched your own brand name or your own sorry, your own like were you trying to market yourself or were you still sort of kind of sticking to the prototype just kind of direct um maybe relationships with musicians kind of uh was that your way of working at that point yeah and the first sort of four or five years uh it was still very early and uh, very much um, working with the prototypes um, because no one knew who I was. And um, and the, the prototypes I was working on with Martin Simpson were just mostly prototypes at that point. Uh, but I was getting my process down 
and trying to understand. And my guitars weren't all that good. And there was a craft. Um, even 30 years in, I find that there's still things that I, I want to control better. You know, uh, mm -hmm. 30, I figured by now, you know, I'd know everything and be able to make a perfect guitar. And it's just not that easy. Uh, <laughs> so early on, if I look at the guitars that I made back then, um, you know, they weren't great. You always hope that you're going to be some kind of a, uh, you know, a prodigy or something, but yeah, they were, they weren't great. And so as I was working on uh, trying to still trying to understand what makes a guitar sound good, how to control those sounds, um, how to make a guitar that has a good tone, but doesn't implode after three years. And um, I mean, all those things. So it was still early on in the, in the first five years. And then somewhere along the way, uh, maybe, you know, uh, seven to 10 years in, I got some, some instruments. Uh, probably the first one was the one that you talked to Michael Chapdelaine about, the one where he came over for a concert and uh, strummed the guitar. And then he he uh, had a you know a twenty thousand dollar Brazilian rosewood guitar by a maker who will go nameless. Um, but he never played that guitar again. He played <laughs> <laughs> he played the guitar that I built uh, uh, for the concert that he that he did at the house. And um, and then kept it basically, as he said, mm -hmm. um, and never and never played the guitar. So um, and that was the one that was the design that I'd actually worked on with Martin Simpson at that time. That was the only uh, design that I had. It was sort okay. of my steel string guitar, kind of a OM shaped or a little bit bigger than that, and it had a a, a lattice graphite composite bracing with a double top. That's kind of what I came up with. I still make that instrument um for those who want it um and it's a great finger style a guitar uh but that was the first one and i sort of thought at that point well that'd be this is my instrument now and this will be the one that i make the house concert series where people would professional players would come in um uh they would play my instruments and e either love them or say oh gosh this is good but can you do this and so i kept on working with professional players and it's always these players that are driving me on to do design so now fortunately or unfortunately instead of having one design i've got like 20 so i have to have you know <laughs> any maker out there knows you have to have molds and work boards and uh for, for all these so i have to store these things somewhere so i have all these these shapes uh because various players ask for something else so um uh, say you know willie porter uh wants something completely different than say michael chaplain does and john doyle uh, who strings his guitar with a 70 on the bass needs and wants a dreadnought wants a whole different thing have to brace it totally differently than say the early chaplain model or the martin simpson model um, and on and on and on. So mm -hmm. uh, it's the professionals that drive the the new models and the new technologies. And I'm doing things now with construction that I never even dreamed of back then, all because players ask for something um, that uh, I didn't know existed. And uh, so a player comes along, wants something, and so I make a prototype, a disassemblable prototype first. I don't want to have to make ten finished guitars. To get to the place we want to be, mm -hmm. make a prototype, send it back and forth, or they come over, I go over, and then we change one thing at a time. That's kind of the semi scientific way, right? You don't make a whole new guitar. The neck's the same, the body's the same. Let's say you're just changing the bridge, or just changing the top, or just changing the bracing, or whatever. You take it apart, change one thing, put it together again. And that lets you hone in on the tone that you're looking for. Um, and um, finally, once I'm recording all along the way, exactly the thicknesses, the the, the masses, the every to the thousandth of an inch to the tenth of a gram. And so, once we get the sound we want with a prototype, then we can re I can reproduce it exactly in the final guitar, so it'll sound exactly the same. And then I can make ten guitars just like it, exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, there's no guessing or apologies. Oh, yeah, well, it's kind of okay, but it's not what we thought. It's exactly the same. And so that's really the fun part. Wow. Man, that's that's incredible. So, yeah, so you really didn't come at it from the sort of just going after the pre-war thing, trying to sort of reproduce that. You 
started like you kind of started from a different place because I mean like you look at your guitars and you're like oh yeah om double o like those are familiar sizes but they're so you're sort of your approach to it and what's going on inside is not necessarily just what a lot of other pre-war style builders are doing so um so yeah so do you sort of have like your standardized bracing at this point or do you really each guitar is kind of its own thing depends on the player's needs yeah, each model is its own thing. Um, okay. There was, uh, yeah, there's no standard. I mean, so now I have, you know, I don't know, 20, 20 models or whatever, um, and each one has its own bracing system. I mean, there's similarities. It's not like I'm starting from scratch each time, um, but some of them aren't lattice. Some of them are double top. Some of them are not. I mean, it just depends on the player. And to the point uh, you just made about um, not following the pre war thing. Yeah, I, when, when I started early on, I realized right away there are so many great players making those. There's no way that I can compete with that. In other words, um, I'm starting out, you know, five years in or, or or whatever back then. And there are already people that are doing these amazing guitars. I've been doing it for decades. And, and you know, who am I to 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 try to um, make it better? Or could I ever even make it as good? I mean, there's so I want to do something totally uh, different using the sort of scientific method and composite materials have allowed me to do so. I mean, you, the guitars that I make, you might like it, you might not, but they're, they're different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you, let's say you take the OM that you have there and you put up to a, a Martin OM or a Collins OM, and you might like one more than the other, but at least the one that I made is, is, is different objectively. It, it mm -hmm. sounds different. Um, and, uh, so that um, at least if I show it to somebody or someone plays it, um, it's not just the same old thing. I guess that's the that's the idea. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, what do you find is is your most commonly built? Are they things like the OMs and and the the Chapdelaine lore model? Yeah, it, it, it goes in phases. Like there'll be a um, like for a long time, uh, Chapdelaine, um, you know, pre COVID was out touring with the. Um, that original, uh, we'll call it the the SS seal string model, um, and, and so people were wanting that one. And then uh, for the last couple of years, Kotke, Leo Kotke has been touring with the with that lower size thing, um, and so I, I got a lot of uh, requests for those guitars. And so it kind of just depends um, <clears throat> on who's playing. And then um, I get a lot of requests and say the Irish community, Irish guitar community, uh, for say a John Doyle copy, a big dreadnought, where you can uh, do that. Um, that rhythmic comping thing but then also it's designed to be able to do the melodies as well um flat pick melodies and it depends um uh, on who's who's out there touring uh <laughs> for a given you know five-year period that's what that's what i get the most uh requests commissions for those yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's talk about bracing a bit more because, yeah, so you, you use like a composite bracing. So what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so the idea is that you take uh, a bracing and the main principle is trying to lighten it while either keeping the same strength or making it even stiffer. And so you take, uh, let's say, a standard X brace um, and one of the things is you can uh, either onlay some graphite or you can make a sandwich where you have uh, a line of graphite down the center of it so that you can then take that same brace and maybe make it less tall or maybe make it thinner or both. And so you get, let's say, a bracing system that is maybe anywhere from, depending on the design, 15 to 30 percent lighter than a standard, say, X brace, for example. Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing in and of itself. But if you then tune everything else to it, the mass of the bridge, the mass of the top, the thickness of the top, the, the body, uh, you can get then, say, more dynamic range, or you can get a more even range across the fretboard. Uh, the idea being that if you think of a vibration of a string as, a, as an oscillation, a pendulum, everyone knows if you take a pendulum and you change the mass, you're going to get a different vibration. Or... Um, if you change the length, you get a different vibration. And so what you're doing is you're taking a known energy from a string and you're putting it into a top that's maybe lighter. And so you're going to have more amplitude. You're going to vibrate more. You're going to get more volume. Um, that's, a, that's the beginning point. Uh, maybe making a guitar that um, has more dynamic range for the player. Um, and then you take that 
greater dynamic range, and then you do things to tune it in. Otherwise, you just get a big gong. I, that, my <laughs> early designs were, you know, very, very light, but you know, you hit it, and it's just, it's just all over the place. Unfocused sound, horrible. Uh, but then, if you hone it in, uh, uh, with many experimentations, uh, then hopefully you can get a tone that is focused and clear and even, kind of an equalized tone, if you will, across the fretboard. So that's that's one uh, of the uses of the composite material. The other is um, using the, uh, the the Kevlar honeycomb, the Nomex honeycomb for a, a double top. Um, that's a thing where you have two thin skins of wood that can be as thin as a half a millimeter. Yeah, Paul yeah. Wilson does that too, right? I think, yep. Yeah. There are a lot of folks. And actually kind of started in the classical world um, because uh, classical guitars are these these – really, really quiet little instruments and people are trying to play them in bigger and bigger uh, auditoriums and uh, and classical players often refuse to use an amplification. So you're trying to make a guitar that sounds big. And so uh, I think the first person I was aware of that started doing composite things was Greg Smallman from Australia. And so everything I've done actually is just built on that, you know, the Smallman thing, you know, trying to see how you can get um, a guitar that is more. And mm -hmm. so the double top, um, is two thin skins with with basically air in the center. Once again, you're trying to make it lighter. So when you put the known amount of energy into a string, you have more amplitude because you're moving less mass. Um, there again, it can sound like a gong and just sound horrible, but if you get the right bracing and you focus the tone, then you can get a really great sound. And the top is so light with a double top that you get this, this, this piano. People always talk about a piano like attack, but that's what it is. As soon as you hit that string, it the, the the attack jumps and then takes a long time to decay as opposed to this kind of uh parabolic kind of thing so you hit it bam and so a finger style player that wants to do articulate things um has a lot of a lot of stuff there um you know chapter lane is notorious for playing an entire you know classical repertoire on a steel string guitar and so suddenly he had all this uh all this dynamic range and and all this focus all the way up and down the fretboard um because it was like a like a piano uh mm -hmm. hit that string and it and it pops out um and that's different than um what i can do with carved spruce bracing and a heavy spruce top yeah interesting so you did mention lattice bracing briefly um yeah. is that so that's something that you do employ on some guitars but not all guitars yeah, yeah. exactly yeah yep in those early designs uh, so again i i went right from the Smallman thing, which is a lattice brace, mm -hmm. right? Lattice balsa wood bracing with carbon fiber overlays. And I tried to do that with steel string. And I found that didn't work at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I ended up uh, uh, sort of redefining the lattice brace, uh, experimenting over and over again, find something that worked with steel string and end up with a lattice brace. It was actually a, it's actually a cedar or spruce lattice with carbon fiber overlays, no bridge plate, um, super, super light, but really strong. Um, I actually arched the top, uh, a, a pretty highly radius top, molded, not carved, but molded. And that really gives uh, a lot of strength to the, to the design. And um, and so, yeah, uh, a certain percentage of my um, guitars that I make, depending on the desires of the player, are these um, uh, double top lattice braced steel string guitars. <clears throat> wow. Cool. And so do you find too, I know that part of sort of your mission is to also have your guitars be like have longevity and, and to have like stability for gigging musicians who are going to be traveling all over the place. Do you find that the double tops and the lat like the lattice bracing, the composite bracing like helps to ensure, especially I guess the, maybe the stability through different environments? It seems to, I think that uh, a lot of the players have told me that, um, Billy really Porter, John Doyle, uh, Michael Chaplin, to some extent, have said that that they just don't change. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they're still wood, and so you're still going to get changes. Um, it's not like a a rain song, you know, that doesn't change ever. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's still wood, but it, but I've been told that they are more stable uh, on a tour than a lot of um, standard wooden braced guitars without any composites in them. So yeah, mm -hmm. generally speaking, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's so important when you're, if that's all you do and you're doing it every single yeah. night, it's, it's so frustrating if you're like, I feel like this thing is moving around all over the place. Exactly. So that's a yeah. really valuable asset. 
Um, do you, do you find that you have to do anything differently with your construction of the back and, or do you choose to do anything differently with the construction of your back and sides to sort of like match what you do with the tops? Sometimes, uh, mostly, uh, sometimes I'm doing more and more of that now. And I'm still learning when I started originally. And still, when I'm working on a new design with a player, I try to start with the known. In other words, um, I want something that's familiar to the player as a start. And so oftentimes I'm doing everything exactly the same with the back and the sides, but just changing the, the top construction. But I found recently that sometimes I need to say stiffen the back by making a molded back, or I need to um, stiffen the whole thing by making um, molded back and molded sides and maybe even bracing the body with graphite on the inside. So a, a little bit. Most of my designs, though, start with basic, uh, if you look at the inside, basic um, construction, same carved braces in the back and uh, all that stuff. But um, yeah, more and more often, um, some of the newer designs with the super, super lightweight tops, I'm adding some extra stiffness to the body and it's making an interesting difference. It's a slow, a slow evolution, but yeah, uh, starting to do some of that. Cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. finishing or do you send those out to someone else um i do some of my well i send the lacquer finishes out to uh it's really great luthier um who also is one of the best finishing guys in the country a guy named mark piper mm -hmm. uh in in texas um but i do a lot of my own um french polish finishes uh i do that myself and i use um i use some uh, uh espresso powder for the for the for the grain filler uh, uh -huh. <laughs> mix it with some uh some shellac into a toothpaste like paste and you use the, use that as grain field. And then in that way, I don't have any explosive toxic materials uh, in my house, in my shop. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to set up a little booth to do some of that myself because shipping, I live in North Dakota right now, it's minus 22 outside. And uh, so shipping guitars back and forth and that kind of weather can sometimes be detrimental. You get frost checking and you got to start over anyway. So um, I'm going to start doing a little bit of that myself, but mostly um, you know, Mark does that for me and he does an amazing job. Awesome. Well, before we move on to, um, to anything else, uh, let's, let's focus on those new models that you have to promote because you've got four, right. That are just, yeah. just recently completed that you wanted to talk about. So yeah, let's, let's go through those. Sure. Well, so I have so many different <laughs> sizes and shapes. And so what I did was I, I decided since I had a little bit of a, a break in commissions to put together, uh, five, uh, guitar shapes that represent what I'm doing. So I started with small and went large. So I have the the Lore LO16, the small body guitar that Leo Kaki uh, commissioned. That was originally his his idea. Um, there again, going back to uh, having the players drive what I'm doing, I never would have thought of building that shape. But he was sick and tired. He said, "I I just want to be comfortable on the road now, and I don't like the big." Uh, the guitars. And so I said, well, what's the most comfortable guitar you ever played? And we'll make a guitar that sounds good of that shape. And so he pulled out of his closet, this old, uh, Lore LO 16. He said, that doesn't sound the way I want it to sound, but it doesn't matter. So I took all the dimensions and traced it. And, and this was years ago. And, and we worked on the sound until finally we have what he wants. So that's, I decided to make one of those. And that's also the one that Michael Chapdelaine most recently commissioned. So, so I have this fairly small, you know, 14 and three quarters inch lower, about 24 and three quarters scale length, kind of small, but a huge sound. So I have one of those. And then I have, going up from there, uh, I have uh, the OM, and that's you have one of those at your store, and uh, I have uh, 
uh, I just built a, a Bacote uh, and Bear Claw Sitka version of that. Uh, it's the same model that I used to record my most recent record called I Came Down. Recorded the whole thing on that um, guitar. It, it uh, recorded beautifully, and I love the way it sounds, love the way it feels. Going up from there, uh, I've had a couple of commissions for uh, quadruple O uh, guitars from some players who are sort of taller. Uh, and so I made one of those. I have a Brazilian Rosewood and a Bear Claw Sitka uh, version of one of those. Um, uh, and then going up from there, uh, I have a, a Dreadnought that uh, is made with Brazilian Rosewood and Bear Claw. No, in Adirondack, kind of a uh, uh, you know, bluegrass kind of flat picker kind of thing. And here again, these are all with, these are, these all happen to be with ultra lightweight, very, very thin tops. Depending on the model, they can be anywhere from 65 thousandths to say 90 thousandths. And if people who know guitar tops, most guitar tops start about 110, 115 thousandths. So it can be anywhere from half to two thirds or half to, yeah, half to two thirds the thickness of a regular top. And that would normally just explode if you put string tension on it. But with the composite bracing, they're steady. You look at them and they're just flat, and uh, even after years. Um, and uh, and so these all are made to be more. They just uh, big sound, they're for articulate playing. Uh, and so uh, I want to kind of get them on the world and, and use them as uh, show pieces and um, uh, just to show what I show, hopefully, show what I do. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely speak from, from personal experience with your guitars, like sitting down at that OM the first time I was just like, what in the, like, just so Good. loud, but not in a way that was like brash or like, yeah, not harsh, want yeah. It. yeah, it's just yeah. like, oh, this is like for the finger style guitarist who is always told that they're too quiet. This is the guitar for you. And it sounds Great. amazing. <laughs> Great. Yeah. They're wonderful. So, yeah. Well, let's talk a bit about tone woods because sure. obviously, like you, you build with Brazilian rosewood. You build with some some less common tone woods like Bacote. So I'm curious to hear what your personal favorites are. Ah, well, um, I like whatever uh, is pretty. So most <laughs> of the guitars that I make uh, here to four, I mean, actually all of them have been commissions, and so I build with whatever the player wants. Um, how I love I love Zircote, though. I think it's one of the most beautiful woods in the world. And as far as actual tone. One of the things that I've been able to do is uh, build a guitar, build build this, let's build, build, let's say an OM out of five different combinations of tone woods and they all sound basically the same. So it kind of almost doesn't matter tonally. In other words, if you adjust for the wood, you can get pretty much the same tone out of them. So for me, it's an aesthetic thing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I kind of, that sort of changes like, you know, for the last couple of years, I thought Zircote was the most beautiful thing in the world. And and then I just built this Brazilian rosewood guitar, and I think that's pretty beautiful too. So anyway, uh, but I still like Zircote, but it's so much fun. I think the, the fun is to have a player ask for something they've been dreaming of and then make that. You know, they've always wanted a uh, uh, Brazilian rosewood guitar, or they've always wanted, uh, you know, a, a, a bees wing mahogany axe or, or or whatever, you know, and then making that for them. It's just uh, – I love the wood that they choose and trying to make it um, sound the way it's supposed to and make it look as beautiful as possible, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so yeah, that kind of brings me to like a sort of the realization that I've had, you know, like working at a, at a guitar store and having all these different sort of woods to sort of try to market. And so it's for a while, I felt like I was going down the path of like, oh, well, this one has this quality and this one has this quality. And that's true. But as I've discovered, talk, you know, just from playing so many guitars and also talking to so many luthiers, like a lot of the sound of the guitar is more in the control of, of you guys rather than necessarily like, like you can't just, you can't blanket statement say all Australian Blackwood is going to sound this way because one maker's version of an Australian Blackwood guitar is going to sound one way and another's is going to sound another way. And there might be some similarities, but it's, it's a lot more down to the builders than, than I think, um, might be sort of we might want to say as like the marketers of the guitars yeah. but it, it's true <laughs> i think it is true and that's one of the things that i've tried to experiment with i've got you know this drawer full of this drawer full of of notebooks where i've you know experimented over the years uh there's a lot of um myth about and you have the one of the best opportunities in the world having all these guitars to compare um yeah a mahogany guitar there's no such thing as, you know, Adirondack spruce sounding a certain way and mahogany sounding a certain way, and it just doesn't exist. 
at least according to my experiments, um, has more to do with density and mass and construction than yeah, anything. And that, so, and that varies yeah. from every different like cut of wood or every different tree. So, like yeah, with spruce for example, like you sort of Adirondack is kind of having this heyday right now. Everybody's like, oh, it's the best one, but there are plenty of luthiers who prefer Sitka spruce and who find Sitka spruce that is just as stiff or yeah. it has some of the same characteristics. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot more wishy-washy than, than the marketing people want it to be. Right. There's a lot of voodoo in there. Yeah. And so what I've done is with the prototypes, like I'll build, you know, five prototypes, one with mahogany, one with, uh, one with um, maple, one with um, uh, East Indian, one with, uh, well, you know, you get the idea. And then I'll use, I'll switch the tops out on them and, and I'll test and, um, uh, and I, I, or the bridges, you know, uh, um, uh, Ebony Bridge versus Rosewood Bridge, all these things. And, and so I've, I've tried to figure out what actually does make a difference and what doesn't. And I think indeed uh, a lot of that is voodoo. Um, I mean, I'm not saying all of it is, but, uh, uh, but, some of the myths about a certain wood sounding a certain way and you, so you need that wood to get a certain sounding instrument doesn't really exist it, you're right it has more to do with the construction techniques and who's making it yeah and the quality of the wood itself and like this is something i, I think uh, grit laskin was really um really articulate about was that like brazilian rosewood at the time when it was be first being used it, it there was great quality brazilian rosewood available it was just really popular it was just it, it was part of like the furniture trade and so it was just it was just around but and, and now it's sort of been mythologized, but it's not but that like the cuts of wood that we're getting now aren't quite the same as they once were. And a lot of that popularity was just timing. It was just sort of a right. coincidence. And it's been it is really beautiful wood and it, it does have qualities like I'm not trying to say that it doesn't at all or, or anything. But um, but there are other woods that you can get a oh, lot yeah. of the same qualities from. Absolutely. I mean, you can um, the prototypes I make are oftentimes scrap wood. And I I swear I can make. <laughs> Scrap wood prototypes sound as good as a $25,000 Brazilian rosewood guitar if you put it together right. So you don't need that to have a great guitar. That's the thing. Um, uh, uh, it, it, yeah, it depends how it's, how it's made. Even the best quality Brazilian rosewood, uh, I can use scrap wood and make it sound as good, I guess is the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the magic of science. <laughs> yeah, sci science. Yay. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm curious to know, so you you learned at the Leeds School, you um you learned from Dell Langens. Uh do you do you sort of still kind of keep up your your education with other luthiers at all or do you m primarily get your feedback from players? Well, yeah, I'm try to be yeah, I'm in constant contact with um other guitar makers and I'm still in contact with uh my, Ivan and and Alan out at the you know the Leeds they don't they don't have a Leeds school anymore but uh, they're still I still sometimes call them up or I actually I talk to them all the time. Um, Alan particularly Alan Chapman again I think he's one of the great classical makers in the world. He's the one that um, when I was taking my first class um, making steel string guitar with with Ivan, uh, Alan came in uh, just walking to the shop and he had. This classic guitar, this is a big shop, and we're using a router. And he sits down waiting for the router to stop, and he's just playing this thing. And it's this, it's got glue drips and it's got blue tape on it. And yet I could hear it over the router, a classic guitar. Uh, and I, I thought to myself, well, what, what the heck is that? Anyway, kind of find out this is one of his prototypes um, that's disassemblable and has blue tape for binding. And, and um, he was the one that. Then I took my classical guitar class with, and he's the one that talked about prototyping and and taking you know this this guitar that he had. This has been changed you know a thousand times. He's taken the top off the 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 changed the bridge, changed the bracing. He's still doing that. Uh, he he knows more about every classical design on the planet than anyone I've ever heard of. Um, most makers have their design. This is what I do. This is my classical guitar. Uh, he can tailor the guitar to the player and can change the tone uh, by understanding his metaphorical tools to make uh, a, a given design um, more what the player's looking for. Uh, and so uh, the point is, is I still talk to him all the time uh, uh, about uh, stuff I'm doing or what's he doing, or this is what I found and uh, we trade back and forth. So yeah, we still, uh, I, and then I try to um, talk to other luthiers that I meet and see what they're doing and 
try to pass along things that I'm doing if they're interested. Um, so yeah, it's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it, it never ends and I can't imagine ever knowing everything. And I'm still, even though I have some, some things that I figured out, I feel like there's, uh, if I did this for another hundred years, I wouldn't have figured it all out, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess that's part of why it's such a, you get up every day because there's just always mm. more to do and more to learn. I think so. I think if I was doing the same design over and over again, I might go nuts. Um, <laughs> but to, to constantly trying new things um, and have you know dozens of designs to work with and to modify is mm -hmm. is the fun thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm curious since you you have that scientific approach, um, are are you familiar much with what Gallup is doing in terms of like their they're very like specific way of grading and and I like I don't even understand what they do with the soundboards to be honest. Right. Yeah, and I don't I uh, I read about it, but I don't know much about it. I couldn't really speak okay. on it intelligently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I mean, what, what, so what I do with soundboards, you know, uh, uh yeah, has uh, I don't once again I <laughs> I can take scrap wood uh, and um, it has more to do in, in with my designs with the mass and the 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 grain uh, run out and the, the the flex I'd actually do flexion tests on, on to see how much anyway whatever so uh, it's a different thing I don't it has more to do with the properties the actual physical properties of an in, individual piece of wood than anything else I guess mm -hmm. yeah yeah interesting yeah I was not to put you on the spot I was just curious to, know, mm. to see if you had any, no, any right. connection with that at all um, yeah no not really yeah. Well, I feel like the thing that comes up a lot with guitar makers is when you ask, like, what guitar would you build for yourself? They have a hard mm. time keeping them in their own house and then in their own hands because, like mm. with Michael, people come along and they want to buy it. And you're just like, oh, OK, I'll sell this one. So do you have mm. a guitar that you've built for yourself that you you will not let go of? Nope. Although I have <laughs> a guitar right now that I that I'm loving playing more than anything else. I, I just finished it. It's the Brazilian Rosewood Quadruple O. Mm -hmm. um, once again, I had this piece of Brazilian rosewood sitting around, and um, I wasn't getting any, any commissions for it, so I just decided to put it together. And it was based on a prototype, uh, and it's kind of the culmination, sonically, of everything that I've been kind of working for. So for me, it's it's perfect for me in the kind of music that I play. If someone wants it, I'll probably sell it, but uh, uh, it's it's the one that I hope to tour with uh, over the next years. And I'm actually, I've had some friends um, who also play my guitars uh, in England and I'm taking a trip to England in June and going to bring it along to show mm -hmm. this new design. You know, Martin Simpson's one of them, a guy named um, Toby Shear, Jack Rudder, um, and other players there that I want to show it to. Um, I mean, I'll play a concert or two. Um, and so that's the one that I'm enjoying playing the most right now, this quadruple Brazilian rosewood um, cutaway thing. Yeah. Awesome. Well, man, we've just like plowed through so much great information. So I'm just going <laughs> to look at my last few questions. Yeah, um, sure. I'm curious to know, do you have any influences outside of woodworking or music or guitar making that sort of you bring in to influence your, your building at all? I don't think so. In other words, um, certainly it's the influence of acoustic guitar music, you know, guitar players hearing Leo Kotke when I was in high school and never after that, either hearing or playing guitar the same, it was transformative. Right. So that kind of thing, mm -hmm. Martin Simpson, uh, with his lyrical flow, I've never heard anything so fluid like that on the guitar. Um, and then, and then John Doyle with his, you know, uh, he's like Jimi Hendrix. If, if yeah. John Doyle was a, was a rock star, he'd be Jimi Hendrix. You know, <laughs> it's that that amazing with his with his use of the fretboard, his fluidity, his improvisation. So those things have influenced me in my guitar making. I want to make guitars that will do that. So that's the thing. Um, then starting with you know the Smallman kind of thing and innovating, trying to get sounds that heretofore didn't exist. So those and then Alan Chapman and so forth. So those kind of things have uh driven me forward in everything that i do um uh, over the years um uh, and i never have never lost the love of acoustic guitar and uh, I can't, every minute i spend here in the shop it's just joy you know mm -hmm. awesome um well one thing i forgot to ask about was your aesthetic approach um you have some beautiful mosaic inlays do you you don't do that in every guitar i, I don't think i saw that on michael's guitar that he brought it was that was a bit more um 
or stripped down and, and sort of simple, but um, do you ever do abalone or anything like that? Or do you just kind of stick with those really precise, beautiful little mosaic inlays? Um, I tend to keep it pretty simple. One thing that I'm not good at, and so many are, is is inlays. In other words, um, there are some people out there, you know, starting with Samaji and, uh, you know, uh, Ray Kraut and, um, and Costal. I mean, they're just amazing at inlays and I'm just, I'm just not. Uh, mm -hmm. So I try to keep it pretty simple. Um, oh, I guess uh, I should have said the rosette's not like, it's oh yeah. Oh, okay. Well, sure. A different, different beast, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I do have uh, sort of a signature mosaic. I think the OM you have has that kind of mm -hmm. uh, dual Harlequin kind of inlay. Um, so, um, and I do that uh, on most of them, unless someone requests something else. Um, mm -hmm. Some people request something specific. Um, if someone does want abalone or whatever, I'll, I'll do that. But otherwise, I try to keep it mostly wood. I like the idea of letting the wood kind of stand for itself. Um, uh, so I don't um, – I'll do whatever people ask mm -hmm. to, a, to a point as far as inlays and, and rosettes and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, what's next for you? So you, you're going to go out on tour at some point in the future to play yeah. your own music. Are you doing that this year? Yeah, I'll be doing that this year. Just small things. I mean, nice. I'm uh, just house concerts at friends' houses and stuff like that. Maybe coffee houses. Just to get, I used to do that a lot, you know, decades ago. But then with my sort of career, I, I had to just kind of stop doing that. I mean, there wasn't time. Um, uh, I was pretty much I've been on call for the last thirty years, and now that I'm not so much, I have the opportunity to do that. So I'll be playing um, stuff uh, off my new record and my first record. Um, uh, and and stuff I've gathered over the years and um, playing it on my my Brazilian rosewood uh, uh, um, quadruple ultra lightweight composite brace and I'll just keep making guitars and hoping that people still want them and yeah are you going to go to any of the uh, guitar showcases this year like uh, artisan or uh, Woodstock or anything I, I might in other words that's one of the things also I've never had time to do. Mm -hmm. Can never leave the house, <laughs> but now that's kind of why I built these five actually models, uh, so I can maybe have them to bring to these these uh, shows. Um, heretofore, every guitar I made was a commission, and so I finally had the opportunity to to have a, a handful that don't have anyone attached to them yet. And so I'll I'll probably be doing that. I've got to look around and see which shows are available and um, which are the. The, the, the obvious choices, but it's, I hope to do that over this next year or two. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I think I'm just about out of questions, except for the, the last ones I always like to ask, which are, um, what, what do you, do you listen to anything while you work in the workshop or do you like silence or podcasts or yeah, what's your, what's your thing? Uh, I do like to listen to things. Um, I, uh, often to listen to my favorite, I often listen to my favorite guitar players. Uh, uh, I have this beautiful tube amp with this amazing, stereo system I I uh I have set up in here so the sound is amazing. I also listen to books, you know, audiobooks and mm -hmm. uh podcasts. Um so I'm usually listening to something. Yeah. It's it's a lovely mm -hmm. way to to spend time with um, some good sound. Yeah. Definitely. For sure. Are there any albums that have come out recently that you're really digging into? I actually have been listening to I'm a little biased. Uh there's a there's this Leo Kotke and Mike Gordon came out with this record called Noon. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I happen to make instruments for both of them, but uh, but the stuff that they're doing, that um, Leo Kotke's music is amazingly dense. But Mike Gordon, with his bass, is able to find a way in that uh, not only doesn't stomp on what Kotke's doing, but actually enhances it in a special way. There's this um, this harmony that goes on. There's this counterpoint that goes on. It's, it's kind of brilliant. So I've been listening to that lately and um, uh, have the actual vinyl and you put it on the you know yeah. turntable and put it through the big system and uh, it's great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been such a pleasure to, to yeah, hear thanks, more about you. Yeah. And we, like, I think we're, we've got a lot of musical things in common. So I was especially excited to nerd out about that stuff with you because it's, you know, it's cool. <laughs> it's it's easier when it's like, oh, we we listen to a lot of the same stuff. It's cool. Um, and people can follow you on Facebook and Instagram. They can hear you play your guitars as you finish them, and they can listen to your albums on Spotify or presumably buy them. I would assume if they can, yeah, if they want to buy them. Yeah, 
Sure. And, yeah, the records are everywhere that you normally get stuff like that, whether it's yeah, all, all the different uh, digital all the platforms. Things, <laughs> and you can buy the actual hard copy if you still have a CD player. Yeah. So. <laughs> Some of us still do. I've got an old car. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> And um, and yeah, and then if they're in your area, if they're in North Dakota, they can come to your house and go to your house concerts, which is a pretty cool absolutely. thing. So. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll put all those links in the, the notes below and, and they can find you online. Great. Thanks, Lizzie. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of Talking Guitar. In addition to the Zero Cody OM that we have in the store right now, which is, by the way, one of my favorites, we just listed four guitars mentioned in our chat on the exchange as sell from workshop, so be sure to check those out in the show notes. And if you're on Instagram, check out our stories today to hear them all played by Kevin himself. He also has two wonderful albums out, and you can listen to those on Spotify. And if you live in North Dakota or are just passing through, you can check out his house concert series where he hosts some really incredible players. Tons of great stuff, and everything is linked below in the show notes. More Luthier chats are coming up soon with JC Baxendale, John Slobot of Circa, Jeff Jewett, and more. So be sure to check back next week for the latest episode.